you remember our home that you stayed with uh, I do. when you found when you found the platypus I, when I saw the platypus, yeah, that's right. We, we saw a platypus in, in the Yarra River. Sorry, hello. No, I'm well, still here. Yeah, well, this is just a group of his castians here. Uh, I don't think I'll go around the room and introduce each one of you, but I think what we'll just do is uh, pick your brains about this. Uh, why are you so excited about gravity waves? Oh, okay. okay. Um, well, uh, I'll say a few things, and then I, I perhaps like to uh, find out um, exactly what um, what's interesting you about them, because obviously you think it's important too, or you wouldn't we wouldn't be doing this over thousands of miles. Um, but I think the thing that really excites me about the gravity waves is that it brings together so many threads of what's so wonderfully human about our exploration of the universe. It, it, at the same time, we have Einstein's extraordinary imagination a whole century on. Um, his rethinking of the fabric of space and time like a fabric, like a medium that can support waves of gravity and distortion of space and time. His uh, mathematization of all that, um, and his realization that you'll probably never ever be able to detect these things because even from the most cataclysmic events, the signals would be so small as to be technologically unavailable. Now, then, then comes in the most wonderful technology of uh, sensitive optics. Uh, the the ability to detect with noise control you know, uh, and all the that other technology shifts of a, a, a four kilometer path of light of less than the diameter of a proton because that's what these waves do and then having so prepared the intellectual path to um, um, the sort of astronomical, sort of astronomical events, events that would that give, give rise to these rise waves, to, waves. To, to, to having seen the, 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 the signal the and signal knowing that that, that, that could that only be two black holes spinning together, together and, 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 and merging and merging forming a single giant giant, giant black, black hole. hole. The team of team five of hundreds of people, the way that, that they they uh, suppressed, suppressed or, con or controlled their excitement, their excitement. So they did the whole did thing the whole properly. Thing they, they wrote the paper wrote without making a press release. It was all um, peer-reviewed peer with the international peer global scientific community. community. There was no razzmatazz no about it, it before the publication the in physics review letters, a proper journal. journal. Uh, you know, everything, everything was, was right, right and wonderful and, and noble. And, and, exciting about it. It's the celebration of the great gift God gives us to explore and understand the universe and somehow possess it less mysteriously but more wonderfully than it was before. Shut me up someone now before I take up the whole hour. <laughs> well, you're obviously enthusiastic about it. Tom, can I ask you just to sort of step back a little bit? What exactly are gravity waves and how were they created and how do we and, and how do we how do we see they they, they come about? Yes. Well, um, well um, I, I'm hinting I, at that in what I, I last what said. I, the I first thing you need thing to you need to do to understand do, gravity to waves is to rethink, waves, rethink gravity. gravity. So since Newton, since Newton we've Newton, thought of gravity, gravity um, as a sort of attractive sort force of attractive at a distance, distance between two masses. Two masses. You think of the moon being perhaps on the end of an invisible spring. Uh, that uh, the earth tugs on it with or the earth similarly on the end of an invisible spring that the sun tugs the earth with and we're all on the end of invisible springs because when we jump up earth pulls us down again right so we tend to think of these invisible springs uh, but that isn't how Einstein taught us to think about that um, he, he noticed that there were strange coincidences about, about these, these springs. These springs. It, it, in, 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 in fact, in, in one of the coincidences, one of the coincidences is, is that is all, all objects, objects fall or accelerate, accelerate under, gravity under gravity at the same, same 
rate independent of their mass. Uh, 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 you know, Galileo was supposed to have uh, showed this was true by dropping a large candle on the tall candle from the top of the Tower of Pisa, and they were falling down the same. Um, same rate. One of the Apollo astronauts famously took a feather and a hammer, to the moon, yeah, and um, dropped them. And of course, they fall under the moon's gravity at precisely the same rate when there's no air resistance. So that indicates that gravity is something more universal than just a spring because why should everything behave as it were on the same roller coaster? So uh, that led Einstein to think that gravity might not be a force in the same sense that magnetism or electricity is a force or indeed these springs, but more fundamentally to do with the shape of space. And then because he already shown that space and time are intricately the warp and weft of the same structure, uh, it, it, gravity then became the curvature of space and time. Now it's very hard for us to think of a ho a ho uh, the curvature of space itself. If it helps, and most some people find it helpful, um, it was to think of a universe as rather than a three-dimensional universe, to think of a two-dimensional universe. Think of, think, suppose we lived in a, on a flat sheet, um, then, then we can think of the curvature of that flat sheet, can't we? We can think of, uh, suppose we dimple um, a, a, a rubber sheet by putting a weight in the middle, and think of things compressing around that, that, um, that, that weight. Uh, then a, a little creature attempting to um, uh, to walk straight ahead in the dimple would just be walking round and round the dimple. You see, on a flat sheet, insert would just crawl straight across the sheet. But getting near the dimple, it would crawl around the dimple. And that, so that's Einstein's idea that a curved space also give rise to give rise to orbit and the deflections of parts of the things we associate with gravity. Now, now you've got all that, right? You've got the gravity, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. the curvature of a sheet, good, right? Now, pick up the edge of the sheet, like when you're making your bed in the morning, and give it a shake. And you see that a space that can sustain curvature can also sustain waves traveling across it. And now we have waves of curvature, and these have a particular speed. And Einstein realized that once one thought of gravity itself as the curvature of space, and let's just assume for the time being that we know how to generalize that idea of curvature of two-dimensional space into four-dimensional space time. Oh, yeah, just move from two to four dimensions, it's just easy. Just within a breath, within a breath. <laughs> then we have gravitational waves. Those are the gravitational waves. Now, I'll stop there at that point. Is that making any sense to anyone, or would anyone like to ask about that? Any questions at all? So, uh, uh, can I introduce you to Russell here? Russell is a, we, we actually did physics together as prac partners at high school. Russ, if you give a wave. Uh, Russell asks the question, what exactly is space? Is, we tend to think of space as being nothingness, but clearly you see space as being something far more uh, far more interesting and intricate than that. Yeah, yeah. So even classically, so there are two answers to this. One's the classical. Um, Einstein is still classical. Not, this is not quantum mechanics yet. Then, then there's even more to add with, with quantum mechanics. So, um, so space isn't nothing, it possesses uh, local properties. Um, uh, and so one of the properties it possesses, the technical name is a metric, uh, uh, and, and that a it, it is a consequence of how curved it is locally. So um, depending upon how close your nearest gravitational mass is, uh, or, 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 or Masses, then your your local space will be curved. And think of our two-dimensional sheet example. There are different ways that can be curved. It could be curved 
round like the surface of a football, or it could be curved. That, that's it, you're going around in the same direction, everything curved away from you. Or it could be curved like a horse's saddle, right? So, or, or a, 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 a cobble between two peaks of a mountain or a ridge. So in other words, it's curving up in one direction and down in the other direction. So in, in high dimensions, there are even more directions in which the curvature can be different. So, uh, so that, that's a property, a geometrical property of, of space. Now, in quantum mechanics, space has many other things going on. There are virtual particles for every field that exists. Uh, there are virtual little instantaneous fluctuations, like little photons of light. There are ghost-like electrons popping out of nothing and going back to nothing again. So. A vacuum is actually a seething space of activity, according to the physics that we understand today. So that's quite different from just seeing space as being completely empty. Yeah, space isn't empty at all. Very full. Full of life. Yeah. Full of, full yeah. of but if you're saying that the curves occur one way and then the other way, how do you get a constant gravi gravity out of that? Does that mean the curve is all in the same direction, or does it mean that the curve is all at the same shape? Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, a constant gravitational field around a planet um, will have a curvature that gets more intense when you get near the planet. So the, the yeah. curvature, the size of the curvature, the how curved it is, depends on is is a measure of the local gravitational field, and and the inverse square law, Newton's inverse square law, comes out very naturally. Uh, as uh, a weak field approximation of Einsteinian curvature. As you move away from the planet, the, the, the space gets flatter and flatter and flatter. Um, and so all this idea of varying strength of uh, a of, of, uh, of field um, comes out of general relativity. Uh, time gets bent as well. So, uh, for example, clocks... Um, Clocks on spaceships, as it were, closer into a gravitation gravitating object will run more slowly than clocks further away in a weaker field. So how about that? So time gets distorted with the space. So if you're going into a black hole, you see, at the surface of the black hole, time stops completely. So both time and space will stop at the surface of the black hole. This is almost as strange as theology, uh, Tom. Not quite. Not quite. Getting there. <laughs> we want to talk a bit about. We want to talk about black holes because the, I said the, I was excited for for many other reasons. But the discovery of gravitational waves. One of the reasons I was very excited is because uh, it constituted our first direct observation of black holes. So, sorry, I missed that. Oh, so I got excited because the, the gravitational wave detection not only yeah. was the first detection of gravitational waves, it was by that, by the strength of that detection, also our first ever direct detection of a black hole. In fact, two. Right. Two, two merging into one. Two merging into one. Yeah. yeah. With yeah. the church, yeah. the famous church. Okay. Richard, come you over here. It's audio uh, free. This is Richard here. He'd like to ask a question. Hello, Richard. Hello. How are you? Yes. Um, I was just wondering um, what, um, with string theory, um, what is the medium that the strings vibrate in? Is it um, the quantum field or what? <laughs> hmm. um, you could be pushing me on this one. I'm not, um, though a theoretical physicist I am, a string theorist I am not. Um, they, they don't, okay. So um, all these particles don't vibrate in a medium in the sense so this is where this is where um, the classical analogy breaks down because you're sort of asking a more general version of this question is okay are we reinventing the sink of the ether so is there some fixed material in which these these waves or these excitations occur um, because if that were true then we would have a framework in which we could define absolute motion which I, I, Newton thought he could, um, and uh, Einstein realized we, we couldn't, and Poincaré and, and others. Um, and so it, it isn't like that. There isn't an ether, a sort of medium in which these waves 
occur. It's more like that that um, space itself is, um, is 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 curved. Now the strings are uh, a, a different. They, they well, like all particles, they have their own their own field. Um, it's a for every particle. Uh, there's a there's there's a new field that gets excited. So they aren't the excitations of anything else. They're the they're the excitations of themselves. And there's a there's a string field throughout space and time, um, and, and and that's what's getting excited by the by the quantum strings if they exist. No one's detected them yet. It's a mathematical theory, and all this stuff of black holes can happen whether there are strings or not strings. We don't know. We know about that. Well, at least you feel that you're a little further with black holes and that now you've actually got some experimental data to back up the theory behind it. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you've seen the data. I think it's quite impressive. So I, I, I sent Emily a little email with a picture early on this morning, but I don't think it kind of arrived. I checked just before we uh, arrived. And I don't know whether this Google Hangout thing allows me to post pictures. Um, does anyone know whether it does? I wonder. Possibly Emily? not. Never mind. Sh share, you can share your screen, apparently. I can share my screen. Ah, OK. Well, let's have a look at that then. Um, and I'll see if I can, OK, um, bring up. Oh, no, I'm going to have to do something clever. Wait a minute, because that's on my other device. Can you still hear me OK? Yeah, yeah, we're hearing you fine. Can you still we're, see we're, me or not? we're watching you searching. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes, you are. Yes, yes, you are. That's right. That's right. So what I'm going to do is to um, pull out. No, I know what I'm going to do. Sorry. I'm going to go and show you the paper that, that, that this thing was announced in. Because have we got a copy of it here? Have we? Uh, John Pilbara has brought a copy. Do you know John? No. Yes. No, you haven't. Oh, good for you. Um, well, I thought I would. Well, if you have, is this the is this the physics review letter? Is this the physics yes, review letter? I, I, yes, it is. I can pass it round. People can have a look at the. Picture. Well, I'll also do. I'll stick it up. I'll, I'll stick up the. Um, uh, when my computer, my lengthy computer is very slow, uh, opens it, because there's a very nice color picture. Oh, it's this, oh. I, I didn't print this one in color. I did it for some. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll bring it up on the I'll bring it up on the screen um, when I when I've got it, and we'll see if it. I found the share screen button, which is very exciting. And um, we're getting there. We're getting we're we're getting there, folks. Come on, open the open the paper, dear little dear little computer. We know you can do it. Here we go. In 1916, the year after, there we go, Einstein. It's got a lovely historical introduction. Okay, here we go. So, right, I'm going to... I'm going to Emily. Come on, Emily. Oh, it's not me, it's not him. No, I've got to do it. I'm going to share my screen now. So here we go, share screen. And that's the, that's the screen I'm going to... Share. Okay, now, can you see the paper? Not yet, no. Oh, yes, there we go. Okay. Right, well, you, you yourself have disappeared, but the physical review letter That's is up right. on the screen there. That's right. That's right. So this works beautifully. So this little diagram here, you see my pointer waving about on the yes, diagram? Yes, yes, we've got that, yes. So the first row here is what's happening to the black holes. So here are the two black holes spiraling around each other, getting closer and closer and closer. And the reason they're getting closer is because they're losing energy. And the reason they're losing energy is because they're sending all that energy out in these gravitational waves. And underneath is the, um, uh, the, the prediction from general relativity of the gravitational wave strength one should see. And you can see that what happens is for every orbit you get a wave, you see. And the, uh, the orbital frequency is getting faster and faster. Can you see the waves are happening faster and faster and faster? As the black hole spiral, as the two black holes spiral into each other, faster and faster, and then there's a point at which they merge. There's a point at which they merge, at which the signal reaches its greatest strength, 
And then after the merge, the single black hole that's just been formed, as you can imagine, like a like two um, bubbles coalescing, has has a bit of a wobble. So it wobbles. It's called the ring down. And here's the wobble, and and it all dies away when you effectively have a new spherical black hole. Okay, so bear that in mind. There's the expected signal, and that was all calculated before the observations. Now I'm going to scroll down to the observations themselves. So, so far what you've presented is just the theoretical prediction. That's just the theory. Now, yep. let's go up here and let's see the experiment. So here's the experiments at, at two places. Now, this is the wonderful thing. There, there are two of these instruments, identical copies of the instruments, and they're both listening out at the same time. One in Washington uh, State, Northwest USA, and one in Louisiana in the south over here. And you can see that uh, here's the actual raw data with the noise and everything. Can you see the signal here? Faster and faster and faster, chirp and ring down, and at the other place. Now, the other thing is that the signal was a few milliseconds later detected in, in, sorry, in Washington than it was in Louisiana. In fact, you can even detect, you can even see that, that here's the peak in Louisiana at about no 3.4 of the distance between these two marks. And here it is in Hanford, it's about at 0.5. And that's the distance it takes light or gravitational waves that travel at the speed of light to go from this place to this place. Um, here's now the um, uh, the smooth data um, put on the predictions that you saw before. And you can see that effectively this signal reproduces exactly the, the, the pattern. It's like a signature of what we would see if two giant black holes were merging and then this underneath is a rather lovely way of putting plotting the data again here's time that's the signal and and what we've plotted here is is the frequency of the current signal and, and you can the frequency is really how quickly these oscillations occur and you can see they get faster and faster which is why the frequency starts lower and then as they get towards the merger chirps it's called a chirp up so actually when you can play when you play this back the sound of two black holes merging sounds a bit like whoop, like that whoop. and, um, I, I and how long and how long ago did that black hole collision occur ah right well that is a rather remarkable answer because um uh, we can calculate of course how far away it is because the same mathematics that tells us what the signal is tells us exactly how much energy was produced um and we can measure how much energy comes past the earth and that tells us how distant it was and it's amazing distance it's about 1.3 billion light years away um now that's to be just let's just think a bit so the, the the light has been on its way the gravitational waves have been on its way to us from this distant event for i mean not just not just you know the age of the dinosaurs 100 million but way back before um uh, multicellular life wasn't it 1.3 billion billion years ago we were single cellular life on the earth uh the site so our whole galaxy rim to rim is about a a tenth of a million light years. The distance to our nearest galaxy neighbor, the Andromeda spiral that we can see in the sky, the naked eye, is two, only two million light years. This came from a literally a galaxy far, far, far away. Goodness me. Goodness me. That's wonderful, though, isn't it? I thought I thought you'd like to see the the, the, the real data. I hope that oh, that's happens. terrific. No, that, that that actually is very, very graphic. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, so does it, that make you does that make you feel very clever or does it make you feel very humble oh it makes me feel very humble don't you think so well i just find it, I, I find it just awesome to, to think that we are able to pick up an event from that long ago um and 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 and, and so fine minutely and so finitely yes i completely agree 
it's it's breathtaking and the the, the wonderful ingenuity and the beautiful engineering um, and and the other the other emotional aspect of it for me is the story the great narrative here so people have been looking for gravitational waves or building the equipment or going through generations of the technology now for over half a century and of course entire careers have come and gone getting us to this place with ostensibly nothing to show for it i mean no 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 results um the famous scientist in the 60s called joe weber uh, um built tried to build a gravitational detector out of a giant block of aluminum um i say that in deference to his american pronunciation and and um but there was no way he was going to detect anything with that equipment but but it was the first step on a long 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 road and, and i think there's a there's a certain sort of human wonderful nobility to, to to the way that science progresses that people are willing to 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 set off on whole life journeys that uh that they're just going to have to hand the baton on for others to take further before the journey's end is reached so that really means that scientists are actually stepping out in faith not knowing quite where their journey will take them or they're hoping they will find where the journey takes them but they've got no actual evidence that they're in the right direction uh, that's that's true it's a there's well i've as you know it's more than uh, a hunch isn't it i have written about this uh, this is what i call the role of faith in science um there's a very important role for faith with a small f to play in to play in science sometimes it's just a hunch and sometimes everyone is telling you you're just mad um you need to go against the, the brain to these things sometimes it's a bit of a hunch sometimes it's a hope a prayer but uh yeah you will need to invest a lot in the um the the the, the, the faith the continual astonishment i mean einstein said he's the most incomprehensible about the universe if that it is comprehensible and, and why we should with our meager minds be able to understand uh the the merger of black holes and distant galaxies and the quantum mechanics of the tiny particles in the atom um, is a mystery to me and it's one of the things that a christian worldview makes sense <laughs> it makes it makes sense of this otherwise utterly baffling discovery um wonderful though it is that we find the echoes of mind in the universe wherever we look John, I thought it was um, quite significant that Roy Kerr, the New Zealand retired mathematics professor who, predict, who um, found uh, exact solutions to Einstein's equations yeah. of general relativity in 1963, I think it was, for yes. a spinning black hole, that yes. he should have yes. received a share of the Crawford Prize this year um, in, in the light of that work. And that was a month before the announcement, and I just wonder whether there was any inside information. But a very appropriate um, award, it, I would have thought. Absolutely, um, Kerr was quite an extraordinary visionary and creative, creative mind in his whole business. But um, no, I, I, I mean, I, I think people realised that the technology was getting to the point where. At, some point we would be able to detect uh, a gravitational wave from something but in fact um the the event that was detected wasn't the anticipated first detection so i had an astronomer at uh, durham martin ward who actually was on the peer review panel for for ligo um, he was on in, a, in meetings that afternoon so actually he hadn't heard any of the press releases and i said martin have discussed an extra galactic um coal merge he said no 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 can't possibly have been from a distant galaxy the, the, the ligo detector is sensitive enough to detect extra galactic um events no 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 they were going to detect a super, they were looking to detect supernova explosions single stars collapsing into that hole within our own galaxy um they didn't they didn't reckon on black hole merge seeing a black hole merger because they are of course this was very distant but it was immensely more powerful so uh, but but what i was going to say about Kerr, so i uh, say so, um it, 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 that no it, it was 
some possibility in the next few years we might detect something but but the team kept the knowledge of their signal detection which was in september they, they, they found these things oh, since october, I can't remember now quite whether it's the event is detected it's september or october um they kept it absolutely um quite i think wonderful i mean 500 people no one went to the press um no one uttered a word and i know that because i know a few people who were as it were next in line who would have heard and um, there were a few rumors of rumors going around a couple of weeks beforehand but they turned out um, they were they were soon quashed actually so no i don't actually think no, no i think that was just a really good point. One of our new ISCAST fellows is a, 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 a Professor Ken Freeman. Ken was yes. apparently, uh, do you know Ken or do you know of Ken? I, 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 I don't know Ken. Is he he's, an, he's, an, he's an astronomer who, who actually sort of brought uh, dark matter onto, onto uh, to our consciousness. He's asking a question. I'm not quite sure that I understand the question, so I'll just read it out and see if you can make some sense of it. Go. Let's he says, too. I'm wondering about the difference between gravitational waves generated by similar events, e.g. the in-spiral of a couple of stellar mass black holes that occur at very different redshifts. At high redshift, the universe is much okay. denser. Okay. Is the response of space-time to the event different? I, I just lost you halfway through that. Could you just read it once oh, well, more? It's just I, 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 I lost myself right at the very beginning, actually. <laughs> twang sound and then silence for a couple of seconds and then it scurried to finish. Could you just ask? Okay. I'm a, he's wondering about the difference between gravitational waves generated by similar events. For example, yeah. the in-spiral of a couple of stellar mass black holes yes. that occur at very different redshifts. Yes. Right. Okay. Good. At high, okay, good. at high redshift, the universe is much denser. Is the response of space-time to the event different? Ah. Okay. Now I'm guessing everyone in the room is familiar with redshift and what that. No. Means. Please explain. Can I take that for granted? <laughs> no. No. We have some art students in our midst. Oh, marvelous! Oh, right. Okay. So, so, so there's quite a lot behind that question. Of um, course there is. I expect that from Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, so let's first of all, let, let it, redshift is very easy to, under, easy to understand because we all know about wave getting stretched. Um, uh, the Doppler shift, the change in apparent frequency of sound emitted by something coming towards you and going away from you is something we experience on, or you experience on the streets of Melbourne every day, right? So, uh, yeah, an ambulance or a police car siren. Now, someone's going to have to tell me what remind me what noises ambulance and police cars make in Melbourne. Ours, as you know, go nee na nee na nee na, but I don't think yours do 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 they? Do they have this wailing they're, sound? They're, they're close. That's close enough. Yeah. Okay, so if something is coming towards you. What do you the 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 racing car, the racing car sound? You know, the Formula One. Yum, that sound. Now, yep. now, racing cars engines don't actually change their note when they pass you, right? In, of course, the, if you're sitting in the racing car, you just hear a uniform pitch of this very high, very very rapidly spinning motor. Now, the reason you hear yum is because when the car is coming towards you, the sound waves, which are all being emitted at regular intervals in the car, um, uh, if by the time the next wave is emitted, the car's a bit closer to you, so the wave length of those waves as they reach you is compressed. It's it's smaller, and so the pitch is higher. When the car's moving away from you, each crest of the wave it emits, it emits from a further location, so the wave, the distance between those wave crests is longer, so you hear a lower sound, a longer wave than lower sound. Now, same happens with light. So, um, light being emitted from a star or whatever, moving rapidly towards you, will seem bluer. That's the color is 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 the way of uh, in which we cash out with light the wavelength. But it's moving away from you. It will be redder. Um, now, we live in an expanding universe, 
that didn't, wasn't necessarily true, but that was discovered by Hubble and others since him in the 30s and was, um, was actually predicted from Einstein's equations from um, by a Belgian priest called Georges Lemaitre in the uh, 1920s. So uh, we live in an expanding universe. And it's uniformly expanding. So the further an object is from us, on average, in this expanding universe, the faster it will be moving away from us because every part of the universe is expanding along with every other part and the expansion of all those parts add up between us and that distant galaxy. The more expanding parts there are, the faster it's moving away from us. And in just in proportion. So the red shift, uh, which is the amount by which the light is reddened, which itself is therefore proportional to the speed with which that distant galaxy is receding is also a measure of distance. Yep. And if we know the ratio between the two, so measuring the redshift of something becomes a measure of how far away it is. Now, final step coming behind, <laughs> yeah, behind this question. The redshift also tells us how early in the universe the event is that we are looking at, because very right. long Red, red, large redshift comes from very distant objects. The light has been traveling to us for long, long periods of time, so must have set out when the universe was younger than it is now. Um, and some of the objects now at the threshold of detection of the Hubble Space Telescope um, are galaxies in the very early universe just within a few hundred million years and that sounds a lot of time but it's really very very young the universe is about 13 billion years old so a few million is right the first second of the birth of birth when the baby is still mewling and sprawling and trying to find some milk uh, that those early moments now been detected. So the universe is much smaller then um much hotter uh, it seems the physics is different. So that, that, so all that is what gives rise to this wonderful question. Um, to which the answer is, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Never ask a physicist anything. Um, but no, no. Um, so what I can say is, you will see. What the, the thing I do know is, we should, um, two black holes merging in the early universe probably merge. What doesn't change is the laws of physics. As far as we know, the laws of physics are the same right back in the universe as they are now. So the the actual intrinsic speed of merger, the frequency of the chirp and all that should be the same. I mean, it's different if you have different masses. Uh, all other things it could be the same. But of course, from a very distant pair of black holes, all those frequencies will be red shifted. So rather than hearing whoop, we would hear whoop, or something like that, you know, from a very early, that's what that's what the signal would, would seem to us. But I don't think there's, I think what he's getting at is a sort of change of back, um, effective change of background curvature given the compression of space time as it were. And I don't think I don't know, but I don't. What I do know would uh, incline me to believe there wouldn't be any intrinsic difference in the physics of black hole mergers in the early universe. You know, but that could be wrong. And it would be very interesting. Well, uh, uh, of course, what you'd be looking for is another black hole merger so that we could then uh, see how the first compared with the second. Are we likely to see another one soon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and what other things might we see soon? Um, well, so this this is the other reason. So the third reason, I think this event is wonderful. Um, you know, we've been through the whole story of gravitational waves, now seeing black holes merge for the first time. Um, the third, uh, we've just that's followed the story of the scientist. The third reason that it's a, a, a wonderful event and it's a privilege to see this happening in our lifetimes it's because we now have um, new eyes on the universe or someone I think more appositely said new ears Th this isn't just 
this is better than space telescopes. So you, you know, we don't see, for example, infrared radiation from space um, on the Earth's surface because it's all absorbed by the atmosphere. So we build infrared telescopes, we put them up into orbit, and we can see infrared and ultraviolet telescopes. But they're all the different types of light. It's as if we have been seeing but blind, but deaf to the universe. And here in gravitational waves, almost literally, they are the oscillations of the universe. Now we become hearers of the universe as well as seers only. It's opening up a whole new sensory channel from the events of the cosmos um, to, to ourselves. Uh, so yeah, we, we're agog to, to hear the next one. And they're not just black hole mergers. There are other wonderful um, events. I mentioned supernova explosions. I think that's probably the next thing we'll detect. That there are a few signals there in the detection memory, I understand. But, um, but the signal-to-noise ratio is not so great for them. So um, I think there's this five, called this five-sigma rule that the, they'll only publish data. Um, such that the um, the probability that uh, the signal arose by chance is less than some tiny, 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 tiny number. So I think we'll be seeing other black hole mergers. Um, they're, of course, very uncommon, but they're very powerful, so we can see them from a huge volume of, of, of space. There will be other detectors turning on. There's one in Japan, there's one in Italy, which is going to be turned on. They'll be tweaking up the sensitivity of these things all the time. So um, I think over the next few years we'll be listening out literally for all sorts of twitterings and boomings and rumblings and bashings and thumpings and crashings, the things we expect. But of course, the, Alan, you're absolutely right, the really exciting stuff will be the stuff we don't expect. And that gives rise to the, well, what on earth was that the question? Okay, John, I'll give you the last question. As a laboratory-based scientist now retired. Uh, John, think, just, just lift the microphone up a bit closer, thanks. Yes, right. Um, I think the uh, only time I was uh, a co-author uh, with uh, seven other authors was once or twice in my career, but I actually counted the number of authors on this paper. I think it was 1,014. Yeah. Uh, two, two questions I'd really like to put about that. The first is, how essential was it to have a thousand or so people involved in this? And um, se secondly, uh, who gets the credit? Well, you, what good questions. Um, and what, was it essential to have all those people? Well, yes, it was. Um, I mean, it really was. I mean, I th I mean th that's not the largest number, as you probably know. I mean, some of the Large Hadron Collider um, particle physics papers have thousands, thousands of authors on, and you need all of you need them because these these um, these are not experiments that you or I would have in the corner of our lab. These are experiments that are internationally constructed, involve seven or eight large teams of engineers, computer scientists, physicists, some of them chemists. Um, I. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and you know how scientists work. I mean, I hope you don't. I'm sure you didn't. Um, I, it, very occasionally in the past, um, there have occurred practices where names occur on scientific papers for people who didn't really do much work. Um, what I'm thinking of, I know of a few European institutions of the old school where, and some American actually, where the head of the lab would insist that his, and it was nearly in all cases a him, um, his name went on all, on all papers. Um, that has long since, that practice has long since stopped. But that would only explain one extra name, right? You don't put names on papers of people who didn't seriously contribute to it. So the answer to, to do you really need all the, all the names? Yes, you really do. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not in that league at all, but I, ha I do work in very interdisciplinary physics myself, I think the largest number of authors I've had on a paper is about 20. Um, but that that's, was an exercise in which we needed chemists to make polymers, chemical engineers to look at their industrial properties, experimental scientists in academic lab laboratories, computer scientists to work with computer models, 
um, a theoretical physicist and mathematician do the computation. So I understand how you get large numbers of people. Um, but, but so then, so that gives me 20 because I've got sort of five different or six different disciplinary teams all contributing. Now, each of them, in my case, or perhaps your case, those teams are one or two people. If each of those teams end up being 50 or 60 people because of the immensity of the work, then you get to these sorts of numbers. Um, in terms of who gets the credit, uh, well, um, everybody gets the credit is the answer, and everybody deserves the credit. Um, of course, there are some leaders of the team, and uh, everyone knows who they are. And you know, in so far as um, credit on CVs is important, and it is important for people, we, you know, we, I would recognise if I were appointing such a person to Durham University, I would certainly be interested if they were leading a team or a sub team on on, on, on this. Of course, when it comes to Nobel prizes, um, you know, that's just fluff, isn't it? I mean, it's very nice to get the Nobel Prize, but you can only award you can only award them to three um to three people and so you can't get a thousand I, but i love what richard Feynman said about prizes i think it's fabulous he's he said i don't <laughs> he says he said something i paraphrase i don't understand prizes for science he said why why do people want prizes what could be better <laughs> you know what could be better than having made a discovery in the first place i mean that's the prize how does having your hand shaken by the king of Norway be better than discovering a new particle? It isn't. It couldn't be. It couldn't compete with it. So I don't get all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I think, uh, I think Feynman is right about that. I really do. Well, I think we might give you an ISCAST prize at some stage, though, because you've been very kind in the amount of time you've given to us, and Not we are really. very, very grateful that. I mean, we're, we're rather impressed that we've been able to send messages halfway around the world, which in relation to the uh, distance that the black holes uh, travelled is, is really very, 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 very small. But still, we've just got here. So thank you very much for what you've, uh, what you've contributed. It's been terrific. Well, thank you. It's been lovely to be back for a morning, well, my morning, um, back in your lounge and to remind myself of the hospitality you so kindly gave me last year. Uh, and to see some familiar faces again. So it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, we'd like to ask you again sometime. So keep your diary open.